नमस्कार वेलकम टू दिस लेक्चर इन टूडेज लेक्चर वील लुक एट एनवायरमेंटल डिजाइन विच इज एन इंटीग्रल पार्ट ऑफ डिजाइन ऑफ वर्क स्पेस एंड ऑल्सो एन इम्पॉर्टेंट फैक्टर इन द स्टडी ऑफ इंजीनियरिंग साइकोलॉजी द पास्ट वीक्स वी हैव लुकड एट लिमिटेशन एंड कैपेबिलिटीज ऑफ ह्यूमन्स एंड हाउ दीज लिमिटेशन एंड कैपेबिलिटीज कैन बी यूज टू द बेस्ट to design machine and human interactions we have looked at cognitive capabilities and physiological capabilities of human we have also looked at human movements and other important factors which help engineering psychologists in making a better interaction between the machine and humans an important part of the study of relationship between machines and humans comes from the design of environment most people work in an environment and this environment has a large role to play in the success and failures of performances a human may have the best capability but the environment design could be such that it would lead to lower performances for the human beings a number of environmental factors like temperature the heat cold lighting the design of environment all these factors combined together to the success of performance of humans and these performances leads to a better interaction between the human machine relationship to start the section let me show you the importance of environmental design through a small story now ram manohar is a sales executive his job is to work in the office as well as in the field there are days when ram manohar has to be in the field and the constant variations of heat and cold in the field affects his performances and behavior the outside environment is sometimes too hot and too cold and because of this the conduciveness of the environment hampers ram manohar's performance also while working in the field factors like noise and how the design of the environment where he has to work those also contribute to his performance now let's suppose that ram manohar is to go and meet someone at some place now this someone shares a map of this place to ram manohar and he tries to arrive on time using the map but the more he sees the map the more he con confused he gets and at the end of this whole situation he keeps on moving in the same spot in circles and not finding the point of the meeting so a lot of outside environmental factors can affect ram manohar's performance there are days during which he has to work in the office his office is a windowless environment which is cooled by a central air conditioning system there are times when he is working in front of the computer doing some sales related calculations and he finds the cold of the office to be too much which hampers his performance in terms of doing his job also there are times when he finds that 
he does not have too much privacy. The kind of work space which has been given to Ram Manohar is a small cubicle, but this cubicle is surrounded by other people who are very close in proximity to Ram Manohar's cubicle. So, a lot of conversations which are flowing among other people can also be heard by him. Then within this inside environment which has no windows, lighting has been provided to replicate the natural light. These artificial lights also tends to sometimes create problems for Ram Manohar in concentration. Since he has been working both inside and outside the office, acclimatiz acclimatizing himself to both the environments sometimes become difficult. And so, as a design engineer, what kind of help can we provide to his company so that Raman has get satisfied and has a higher level of performance and satisfaction from his work environment. The issues that I have discussed is the core of this lecture and the one that follows. We will not only look at temperatures and heat and cold and how these factors affect cognitive performances, we will also look in detail issues related to the design of the environment in terms of the interior design, noise levels, wayfinding behaviors and lighting and illumination of the environment in which people work. I will give some pointers and some generic rules which if followed can lead to a better design of the environment in which the people work. As I explained in the beginning of this lecture, the context in which a person works has a very important part to play in how the performance of the person who is working in the environment gets evaluated and gets into action. So, let us start looking at some of these factors which are related to the context of the environment in which people work. Let us start by first defining what is an environment. Generically speaking, people conceive environment as the natural environment, the lakes, the outside world which is composed of parks, trees, people, bicycles and a lot of other things. But when a human factor engineer talks about an environment, it is a little different from how the generic perception of environment is believed to be. Environment in terms of the ergonomist or the human factor engineer could include any area or space in which a person work, lives or plays. What I am trying to put forward is the fact that the context in which people live their lives can be called as environment. And environment not necessarily means the natural environment in terms of tourism or in terms of the natural beauty. It is that integral part of the human which stays with him for most of the time. Human beings during the day move from the office to the workplace to some other places. And while he moves from one place to another, he is in constant interaction with one environment or the other, be it the work environment, be it the play environment or be it the living quarters where he lives. The definition of environment includes small environments such as kitchens, bathrooms or office spaces as well as large environments such as whole buildings, example schools and hospitals, parks, airports and even cities. 
So, the definition of environment can be in terms of both the macroscopic and the microscopic level. At the level of the microscope, microscopic, we have smaller environments which have limited space and which include people. This could be small office cubicles, could be the bathrooms that people use or could be the kitchens and bedrooms in which people sleep. On the macroscopic level, environments could be in terms of designing whole buildings and designing whole parks. It could be like the Rashtrapati Bhavan or it could be the like the railway station. So, right from the very small space to the very large space, environment spans between those two limits. Now, how various temperatures and lighting and noise levels as well as layout and design of the space impact performance is what we are concerning in this particular section. Not only temperatures, which is the variation of heat and cold, but also the kind of lighting varying from natural to artificial lighting and noise, which is any sound that hampers the performance of people or diverts people attention from a job at hand. All of these factors influence the working of people. The layout and design of the work environment also has a large role to play in the success of completing a task. The layout of the environment in which people work like where is the computer keyboard, where is the computer monitor, how far is the chair from the desk, all these uh, parts as well as where is the person sit, uh, sitting and how far is he from other colleagues and other objects in the environment. All these totally comprise of the context within which people work. Let us start with the first factor which is called environment temperature. Now, the temperature of the environment which is the degree of change of hotness and coldness is a major factor and plays an important role in performance. Now, ideally we would want to determine the appropriate temperature for an environment. The problem is in defining appropriate. We often find people wanting appropriate temperatures. Whether you are in a cinema hall which is cooled through an air conditioner and by the time it is the interval you feel too cold or if you are in a park outside and the suddenly the sun becomes too hot, people always want appropriate temperatures. The possible actions that people do for preventing themselves from the sun in the park or from the cold within the cinema hall is to find a place which counteracts the effect of temperature which is making them uncomfortable. So, what is this appropriate temperature that people are wanting? The best guess would be a temperature closest to the body temperature, but is that the truth? Let us look at as we discuss further. Now, if the temperature is extreme either too hot or too cold, it is usually one of the first thing we notice about a workspace. Imagine working in an environment which is either extremely hot or either extremely cold. As you enter this environment, the first thing that you need notice is that you feel uncomfortable. Too hot or too cold 
makes your body either perspire more or shiver more and these are uncomfortable positions and because of that you start complaining. So, extremes of both the heat and cold are something which people want to prevent. So, we need to consider our activity level which affects whether we perceive an environment to be comfortable too hot or too cold. Not only the external environment, but also the activity level has a large role to play in terms of defining a environment as comfortable. If the activity level is minimal, a cold environment would be disturbing. But for people who have high activity level, who move around the office, since they do more work, the body metabolism generates heat to counter the cold feeling that they are having in the office and because of that they would feel more comfortable. So, depending on what your activity level is, environments can be termed as comfortable or not comfortable. Not only temperature, but also humidity level and air flow helps us perceiving the hotness and coldness of an environment. So, the level of humidity and the amount of air flow also impacts our sensations of temperature and our perceptions of thermal comfort. It is not temperature alone which helps us in finding that comfortable zone for working. In addition to temperature, we have the humidity level and the air flow. The three of them combined together forms the sensation of comfortableness within an environment. Let us now look at how temperature is measured. So, air temperature excludes the impact of air velocity and humidity. When we are only measuring temperature of air, we use it by using a wet, by using a dry bulb thermometer. And the dry bulb thermometer is cased in such a way that it is not affected by environmental humidity and air flow. Now, the dry bulb thermometer only gives you temperature differences in terms of degrees of hotness and coldness as measured by the mercury pressure. Now, in order to measure air temperature, the sensor is always shielded and kept dry. But the measure of comfort in temperatures differences results not only from measure of dry air temperature, but also in terms of variations in humidity and air flow. So, humidity affects our subjective sensation of heat and cold and we try to assess the amount of water vapor in air. Humidity relates to how much water vapor or moisture is present in the air. The more water vapor is present in the air, the more uncomfortable you become. Now, this humidity is generally measured in terms of relative humidity. Relative humidity is the amount of water vapor present relative to the amount of maximum water vapor possible at any point of time. If the amount of water vapor present in the environment is less than what it can carry, this loss will be filled in by processes of evaporation or transfer of heat from the person to the environment. When the humidity is 100 percent, this transfer of heat or transfer of water vapor would stop and would lead to stillness. So, humidity then is an important factor which adds up to dry air temperature. Another factor which influences our sensation of hotness and coldness is air velocity. 
air velocity or the amount of air flow or drafts can vary within environments and have a significant impact on comfort. Imagine those situations where you have no air. The flow of air is very still and the humidity is very high. Summer months in the east of India, people become too uncomfortable for the very reason that although the heat change is not too much, but the air is filled with water vapor and it cannot take more of water vapor. There is no wind flowing and because of that people perspire because the body gets too hot. But this perspiration cannot get evaporated because the air is already filled with moisture. This leads to the idea of discomfort. In those situations, people try to move to places which have some movement of air like near a fan and this air velocity or the movement of air makes people more comfortable. So, air velocity is an important part of the perception of temperature. Air velocity which is lower than 30 feet per minute which is 0 0.5 meter per second is equivalent to still air and has no impact on sensation of temperature. So, if you want to have the effect of air velocity on the perception of temperature, the flow of air should be higher than 30 feet per minute or 0 0.5 meter per second because at these levels the air would be still. So, the temperature which the thermometer measures is the dry air thermometer temperature. But perception of temperature by humans is called affective temperature and as I have explained this is a combination of multiple factors. Affective temperature reflects the combined effect of air temperature, relative humidity and air velocity. All three of them combined together leads people to feeling hotness and coldness and comfortableness and discomfortableness in an environment. Different combinations of air temperature, humidity and air velocity can feel the same to us resulting in the same affective temperature. So, varying one of these factors and keeping the other two factors constant or varying all the factors in different amounts can lead to the same perception of effective temperature. What it means is the temperature being constant, a change in humidity and air velocity can lead to perceptions of different levels of comfort in people. Now, objects in our environment also influence our sensations of temperatures. Not only the humidity and the air velocity influence our perception of temperatures, objects which are present in our environment also contribute to our sensation of effective temperature. Now, if we sit next to an outer wall during the winter, we might sense the coolness of the wall surface. This is referred to as the mean radiant temperature. We have seen this phenomena where people when they stand next to objects which are cold or hot, they tend to perceive and feel hotness or coldness emanating from these objects. If you if it is cold and you are standing near a wall which is heated, you will start feeling warm because heat moves from the wall from the warm object to the cold object which is your body and this happens through radiation. On the other hand, if you are in a hot environment and you are warm and the outer world is cold, heat starts moving from 
your body to the wall and you start feeling a cold, a coolness. So, not only the velocity of air and the humidity and the temperature affects our perception of heatness or coldness, it is also objects which we interact with too often responsible for our perception of comfortableness or uncomfortableness. Now, the measure called the wet bulb globe temperature considers air temperature, radiant temperature and humidity. So, the wet bulb globe temperature which is measured through a wet bulb thermometer where the bulb of the thermometer is put in such a way that the wetness of the environment also affects the temperature is used to measure the effective temperature and this effective temperature which is measured through the wet bulb globe thermometer is a composition of the air temperature, the radiant temperature and the humidity. Now, the temperature is measured with a wet bulb thermometer. The bulb is kept wet and as humidity levels decreases below 100 percent, cooling due to evaporation increases lowering the temperature reading. So, at 100 percent humidity, the wet bulb thermometer will have no effect, but as the humidity goes down, evaporation will lead to cooling and because of that, changes in temperature can be recorded because of the fall of humidity. Not only the temperature, but the exchange of heat also has a role to play in our perception of comfortableness within a working environment. So, environments increase stresses in our bodies when we cannot maintain our core body temperature around 98.3 degree Fahrenheit or 37 degree centigrade through the process of homeostasis. If we get too hot, the body tries to cool itself by perspiring. The effect of temperature is to heat or cool the body and this heating or cooling of the body leads to the exchange of heat either from the body towards the other objects or the environment or the vice versa process. Mostly the human body would like to maintain a temperature of 37 degree centigrade and this is the core body temperature which the body maintains through the process of homeostasis or metabolic activities that are going inside the body. If a person gets too hot, perspiration forms on the level of the skin and these perspiration takes off heat from the skin and evaporates in the environment, thereby taking the heat from the body and moving it into the environment in terms of perspiration drops. When this process happens, the skin becomes cooler as the heat is now exchanged from the body to the environment. Now, when the perspiration moisture evaporates, it helps cool the body. As the cooling continues, our bumpy skin or goose flesh reduces the amount of air flow and evaporation. So, if the evaporation of perspiration happens for a longer period of time, the body will cool down too much and to prevent that, the goose flesh or the bumpy skin on the outer part of the skin, when it senses the body has reached a comfortable temperature, it lowers the flow of air and evaporation, so that no more perspiration or very little amount of perspiration happens and the heat exchange can be maintained. This way, the skin and the body protects itself from getting too cold on a very hot day. Now, if we get 
too cold our body tries to warm itself by shivering. So, the human body and the human skin has its own mechanism of cooling and heating. If it feels too cold, we shiver and by this shivering heat is generated and the body temperature comes above normal. If we feel too hot, perspiration occurs and this perspiration takes away heat from the surface of the skin to the environment and cooling happens and this way the appropriate temperature and heat is maintained within the human body. Now, the process by which our bodies gain or lose heat is known as heat exchange and involves the process of the body either gaining heat from or releasing heat to the environment. So, this process of sending heat to the environment or receiving heat from the environment is called heat exchange. Now, the process through which the transfer of heat happens from either the body through perspiration or it happens from the environment to the body happens using four different processes. These processes are called radiation, convection, conduction and evaporation and all of these processes play a very integrated and important role in the exchange of heat from the body. This exchange of heat between the body and the environment makes us feel comfortable and if we are comfortable, we tend to perform better on jobs which have been given to us leading to better performances and good output. So, what are these processes which help in heat exchange? The first is called radiation. Radiation as most of you would be familiar is the exchange of heat between two non-touching surfaces. Although the two surfaces taking part in radiation are not connected to each other by any medium, there is an exchange of heat between this both mediums through vacuum and this process is called radiation. A good example here is sitting next to a window on a hot or a cold day. So, even when people are not sitting close to the window or touching the window per se, they feel cold or hot and this feeling of coldness or hot hotness is due to the heat exchange between the temperature of the window and the body. The thing to remember is there is no medium in between and this exchange happens through radiation. The other process of exchange of heat is through convection. Here the control of heat exchange is due to the surrounding air or fluid. In radiation, you may not need any object in between. In convection, an object which lies between the two bodies helps in the exchange of heat. Another good example of radiation would be the thermos flask. Now, since there is vacuum in between, the flask does lose heat or cold, but at a very slow rate. And this process of losing heat or cold without in between medium is called radiation. In convection, the two objects between which heat is exchanged is connected through a medium and this medium could be the air or the fluid. One good example of convection is the use of sweater or sitting in a hot tub. So, the water in a hot tub is heated and when you sit in this water, this heat passes from the hot water to your body or the use of sweater. So, when you wear a sweater, 
the warmth of the sweater warms the thin layer of air which gets trapped between your body and the sweater. This layer of air gets heated because of the woolen material of the sweater and this hair this air which is trapped in between in turn heats the body. This process of exchange of heat is called convection. The other process is called conduction where the transfer of heat happens through touching surfaces. So, when two surfaces touch each other or in contact, heat can still flow between them. And good example is touching a burner stove. If the burner stove is very hot and your hand touches it, immediately you will start feel, feeling the heat and you will get some skin decoloration. This kind of transfer of heat from the hot stove to your hand which leads to heat boils is conduction and the last part of transfer of heat is through evaporation. Here the only loss of heat is through cooling. There is no reverse process of evaporation. Evaporation is a one way process which leads to only cooling and the heat loss here is as moisture evaporates. The heat loss which happens through evaporation happens because the air molecules take the heat from the surface which is evaporating and passes it to the environment thereby cooling the surface from which this air molecules are extracted. An example here is getting out of a pool or wet clothes in the rain. In both of these cases there will be evaporation and this evaporation will lead to a cool feeling. Just like the different ways of heat exchange, the clothing that people wear also has a effect on heat exchange. So, the clothing we wear also affects heat exchange because of its insulating effect. The amount of insulation clothing provides is measured using a clo unit. Most clothes are made up of some fabric and each fabric has a tendency of either capturing heat or releasing heat. Cotton is a good material which has a good conducive properties for heat. On the other hand, artificial materials like polymers of nylon can retain heat for longer duration of time and can lead to uncomfortable situations. Cotton on the other hand is a very breathable material and so the material with which clothes are made also leads to heat exchange. Now this heat exchange due to clothing is measured in the clo unit. What is the clo unit? And how does this measurement happen? Let us look at. An individual wearing one clo unit of clothing is likely to be comfortable at 70 degree Fahrenheit or 21 degree centigrade in a room with no perceptible air flow which is 20 feet per minute or 10 centimeters per second and relative humidity below 50 percent. So, a person who is wearing one clo unit of clothing will feel comfortable at 70 degree Fahrenheit temperature and still air flow with 50 percent humidity. A change in one clo unit that is an additional change of one clo unit. So, now we have two clo units of clothing will account for approximately 13 degree Fahrenheit or 7 degree change in temperature. So, as you keep on stacking clothes or changing the clo units of clothes on your body, the temperature keeps on changing. With each additional clo unit of cloth that you wear, there will be a variation of 7 degree of temperature. Now, if our clothing does not allow for enough heat transfer from the body in warm or hot environments, 
this could lead to heat stress or illnesses. Similarly, not having the proper clothing in cold weather can lead to cold stress. A lot of fabric is available in the market nowadays which are blends and these blends are made from cotton mixed with polymers. Some polymers are nylon or terry cotton or other popular polymers. Now, when you mix a blend of cotton with other material, the integrity of the cotton different gets changed or modified and because of that the heat losing and heat retaining pot, uh, property of cotton gets changed. This change in the structure of cotton by mixing different polymers to it leads to different rates of heat transfer and if the blend that you are using does not lead to quick release of heat or to the maintenance of heat in cold temperatures that can lead to heat stress or illnesses. If in the winter you wear clothes which are made up of some of these artificial fabric material, it could lead to trapping of too much heat and because of this trapping of too much heat, the body would get warm inside and precipitation would happen. This sweat that gets trapped within the clothing and the body will lead to increase in temperatures of the body during winter months and after a point of time, it will become uncomfortable and you will have heat flushes. So, a proper clothing should be identified for workers because clothing is an integrated part of heat exchange. Wet clothing usually loses its insulation values allowing heat transfer towards that is during a fire or away that is during a snowstorm the body via convection. So, wet clothing should be used with caution because they can lose their insulation value in different situations. Similar to clothing, humidity has an effect on heat exchange. Humidity can impact heat transfer as humidity increases the water vapor content in the atmosphere also increases. The more the humidity increases, the more moisture from surrounding areas move into the atmosphere and the atmosphere gets saturated with water vapor. During the hot humid summer months, there might be too much moisture in the air to allow for evaporation cooling from perspiration. To increase evaporation cooling, we need to increase the air velocity. So, during the hot months when regions become humid or work environments become humid, this will prevent transfer of perspiration from workers body to the environment. So, they will feel uncomfortable. To make them more uncomfortable, the use of fans or air ducts can be thought of as the movement of air on the surface of the body would make them feel more comfortable because this air will quickly move away the perspiration. Since it is humid, the perspiration cannot go into the environment. So, this air flow will quickly move the perspiration out of the body and they will feel comfortable. Now, when there is little or no air flow, the body's heat cannot be released into the environment possibly leading to heat illness or heat exhaustion. Cases in which the body heat cannot be quickly exchanged in the environment lead to heat illness or heat exhaustion. Now, during the summer months, the temperature often is reported with heat index 
which is a measure of how hot it feels given the humidity level. You would have seen weather predictions and these weather predictions are given in terms of heat index. Heat index is a combination of how much the temperature heat is, the temperature changes plus the humidity level because humidity level combined with raw temperature changes or raw changes in heat or coldness forms the heat index or the amount of heat that people feel. It may be possible that the environment is comfortable, but the humidity is very high and because of that you will start feeling uncomfortable. On the other hand, the temperature very would be very high and the humidity would be low. In those cases, perspiration would lead to better feelings as compared to those cases where the temperature may be low, but the humidity would be very, very high. A good example here is our cloudy days. When it does not rain and it is too cloudy, people feel too uncomfortable. But even on sunny days, when the temperature is a little bit higher than the normal, but the humidity is less, people still feel comfortable. Air flow also affects heat exchanges. Now, fans are often used during the hot and especially humid summer to increase the air velocity as the increased air velocity helps with evaporation, increasing heat loss or cooling. So, not only the temperature and the humidity affects heat exchanges. Flow of air also helps in the exchange of heats. It is found that in regions where the humidity is too high and the temperature variation is less, a mechanism for making air flow is used for making people comfortable. In your air conditioner, you would have a setting called humidity control. Now, within this setting, what the air conditioner does is only blows air without cooling it and this makes people comfortable. So, humidity control can be done by flow of hair and this flow of air could lead to better heat exchange. Heat loss during the winter due to air velocity otherwise known as the wind chill factor can lead to severe consequences especially in extremely cold conditions. Now, during the winters loss of heat during the wind chill can cause severe problems. Excessive heat gain or heat loss. Now, exposure to extreme heat conditions can cause heat stress or heat illnesses. If you are exposed to too much heat, this will cause heat illness. An individual might experience fatigue, cramps, heat rash also known as prickly heat or worst heat exhaustion or heat stroke. Excessive sweating, increased heart rate and an increased core body temperature and are all signs of heat stress. So, excessive heat can be problematic because it leads to not only physical discomforts in terms of fatigue and cramps, but also cognitive decline or decline in uh, cognitive workload. Now, exposure to severe cold might result in cold fingers or cold toes as the body reduces blood flow to about 1 percent of the body flow. People are more likely to experience hypothermia in cold water because of the heat loss. So, in terms of cold temperature also, this excessive gain or excessive loss of heat could be a problem. Other side effects of cold stress include a loss of manual dexterity and the potential for frostbite. So, if you lose too much heat or you get something called cold stress, this can also lead to loss of manual dexterity which means that functioning of 
manual uh, jobs and it could also lead to first bite. There is a term which is called acclimatization and acclimation. There is a difference between the two and let me explain what this difference is. So, individuals who are exposed to cold and hot conditions for prolonged periods show some acclimatization to the environment condition within one or two weeks. If people stay in a particular environment for a longer duration of time, whether it is cold or hot, they get acclimatized with it. But if people quickly move between environments or frequently move between environments, they do not get acclimatized. Think of all those times when you were in the dark cold cinema hall and when you come out of it uh, in an environment which is lighted and hot, you feel the difference. This process of quickly moving from one environment to another is called acclimatization, uh, loss of acclimatization. But imagine that you are a person working in the cinema halls. The cold within the cinema hall will have no effect on you. On the other hand, people who come to watch the cinema, they will feel the changes or the differences. Acclimation refers to our adjustment to one variable, generally temperature. Acclimatization is our adjustment to multiple environment conditions such as temperature, relative humidity and acclimatization is best when the acclimation includes physical activity. Whereas acclimation is our adjustment to only temperature, acclimatization is a process of getting adjusted to the environment which has multiple factors contributing to it. This could be temperatures, humidity, airflow and other factors. Now, the process of adjustment which is acclimation is best when some amount of physical activity is included for doing this adjustment. Acclim acclimatization or cold to hot environment can be challenging if exposure to these cold and hot temperatures is not continuous. When the acclimation process is interrupted even for a few days, then the acclimation process is less effective. So, if we keep on changing from one environment to another in a continuous way, we get adapted to both the environments and we do not see too much change. But if we do this for once in a while kind of a thing, we feel the stress. Think about the person working in the cinema hall. Now, he moves in and out of the hall quite often and so he is become adapted to both the situations and he does not feel that stress on his body while moving out from the cold hall, cinema hall to the outside environment. But people who watch cinema, they do it once in a while and so when they move from the hot outside area to the cold cinema hall or from the cold cinema hall to the hot outside area, they feel the stress on their body. So, if you continuously move between environments, the acclimatization would be fast. Now, heat can lead to decline in cognitive performances. What kind of cognitive performances decline can heat lead to? Let us understand. Heat effects in some cases result in performance decrement with no effects or even increase in performances in other. So, heat at sometimes would not lead to any change in performance, but in some cases it will lead to increase in performance. Reaction time for some simple motor tasks, it not usually affected by heat stress, while complex tasks such as vigilance, tracking and multitasking are more greatly affected by heat stress. So, higher cognitive tasks like reaction time and motor tasks are not affected by heat, whereas attention related task which is uh, the sustained attention vigilance task or multitasking are affected by heat more. Now, one argument for why more complex tasks are more greatly affected by heat stress is that heat might affect our ability to attend to various tasks. Why higher order cognitive tasks? are more influenced by heat. The reason is that our attention gets diverted or 
it gets manipulated and so we cannot attend to uh, those factors which lead us to perform these higher order cognitive tasks. The maximum adaptability model which suggests that as stress that is heat decreases or increases performance decrease as a result of decrease in or the depletion of attentional resources. So, the maximum adaptability model says that due to the depletion of additional resources, the performance would decrease as the stressor increase or decrease. Now, as the heat stress increases towards hyper stress, this model proposes that reduction in performance will occur long before physiological problem will occur. So, with hyper stress or increase towards the hyper stress uh, value of heat, people will feel cognitively tired much before being physiologically tired. People will display various types of performance decrements long before the severe effects of heat stress would appear. Decrease in heat stress towards hyper stress could lead to decrement in cognitive performances. Now, the decrease in stress towards the hyper value or lower value could also lead to decrement in cognitive performances. Data supporting this model come from research that varied the dry bulb temperature and relative humidity. So, experiments were done where the humidity and the dry temperature those were uh, changed at different values and people's performance were evaluated on those uh, different values of the humidity and air temperature. Heat stress affected working memory the least affected visual and auditory input a bit more and had the greatest deliberative effect on the manual tracking task. So, higher order cognitive task like working memory was affected the least whereas, visual and auditory input and tracking task were affected the most. The researchers referred to these varied effects as heat stress selectivity effect. If individuals are working multiple tasks that tap their working memory and relative humidity levels should be considered while addressing the effect of heat stress on performance. So, if you are doing multiple jobs or you are doing a job which taps onto multiple uh, memory functions, you people should not only consider the heat, but also the relative humidity and air flow while measuring the performance of people during uh, this increased heat or decreased heat condition. So, in today's lecture, we looked at temperature and heat exchange and the effect of heat on cognitive performance. In further lecture, we will look at the effect of cold on cognitive performance and also other variables of the environment like environmental design, like noise levels, lighting and spatial arrangements of the environment in the performance of people. So, this is all for today. Namaskar and thank you.